this is my channel now. Buy the kit, they said. Build it yourself. It's much more rewarding. I probably shouldn't have dumped the whole box out at once. Deep breath. This can't be that bad. Sample instructions like a college. All right, it comes with instructions. Table of contents is like eight pages long. All right, in situations like this, it's important to remember that even the longest journeys begin with the first step. Step number one, do not eat all the gummy bears. Looks like this thing comes with tools. That's pretty cool, I guess. Needle nose pliers, Phillips screwdriver. It's a pretty big tip on that. Some Allen wrenches. You'd think the kind of person inclined to buy a 3D printer, let alone the unbuilt kit, would probably have tools like these already. But that's nice of them. I mean, I'm sure I paid for them, but that's nice of them. Looks like step one is a Y-axis. I guess we're making that. I'll start digging in. I'm not gonna go through this step by step, but let's see what happens. Building this on a thick aluminum plate, it's not super flat, but it's flatter than my bench. Now you just put your lips together and... <whistles> took that about half an hour to print. 28 minutes, 38 minutes. I could have driven out and bought one in that. It is pretty cool. It was able to close the top without support material inside. Like keep it hollow and close the open span on the top side. I didn't give it much thought, but I was expecting it to print in maybe two pieces or grow a peg or something through the center. Y axis. 8020, that looks pretty nice. Painted aluminum with sparkles. Four times extrusions, one times frame, M5 by 16 screws. All right, cool, everything is labeled. Y axis, M5 by 16. I've just come across my first set of bearings and I think I did see, I was I saw something in here. Here it is, lubricant, though it doesn't say what it is. I mean, I don't know if that's lith. I don't think that's lithium. I don't know. I should have some of that white lithium somewhere, and that's what I'll pack them with. I'm using just a bit of Vibratite on all the fasteners. It doesn't take much. This is not like Loctite. It's not a thread locker per se. It's more like a an engineered tree sap. I'm using the VC3. Make sure you don't get the VC1. Though I'm sure like a very light thread locker would probably be fine too. No affiliation. This is just uh, specific for applications with potentially a lot of vibration. Not sure exactly how this is supposed to work. There we go. Now I can add it to my good pliers collection. I've been having a heck of a time trying to get the twist out of this aluminum frame. At first I thought it was maybe the aluminum plate I was building on, then I figured no way, it's got to be good enough. I mean it's pretty flat. So I was about to start shimming in between the plates and the extrusions when I decided to move this all onto a surface plate. This is an old cast iron plate, it's not in the best shape, but it's got to be better than that aluminum plate. Probably overkill, but what I did was weight the frame down, loosened all the fasteners, tighten them back up again. I should have just done that on the aluminum plate. Again, surface plate probably overkill. If you're doing this at home, if I didn't trust the plate or the bench top, I'd probably use like a piece of glass or something. But I managed to get it down to about five or six thou. What's that, about six thousandths? According to the book, the printer can self-correct 
looks like up to two millimeters, 80 thou. So as long as you're under 80, you should be golden. If only there are a way to... All right, it's time for some bearings. A friend of mine who's smarter than I am suggested I wash and grease these bearings before installation. And I just want to make sure these don't come already packed. And sure enough, they do not. These bearings do have just the slightest film of oil on them, but those are wiper seals on each end. So this thing I think should be packed with grease. There's maybe a lube step later on, but once these are on the rails, those seals won't let anything in. I mean, maybe a smidge of oil would get in there. Since I obviously didn't get enough gummy bears in this kit, I've been snacking on their lubricant. And I'm starting to think more and more this is white lithium. So I'm going to squirt some in there. Cap the end and just use the rod to try to build some pressure and get that to move into the raceways. Wow, that kind of took a lot more than I expected it would. Oh, nuts. I meant to wash these out first. If you want to do this the right way, let these soak 15, 20 minutes or so in some isopropyl alcohol. Swirl them around every couple of minutes, then pack them full of grease. These are installed here. There were some U-bolts. I think I saw an insert. Assembly manual update. They want me to clock the ball bearing raceways at like the four and eight o'clock position. In the manual, there was this picture. You probably can't see this, but they were down at six o'clock. I saw something in the manual that just broke my heart. Needle nose pliers to tighten these nuts. Back in my day, that was grounds for dismissal. Use a nut driver the right size. I don't own a 5.5 millimeter nut driver. Let's see if that's still clocked correctly. Moved a little on me. It's hard to see in there. I don't know who packed these things so full of grease. One down, two more to go. Install the Z-axis motor holders using three times M3 by 10 screws. Caution, do not use excessive force during the tightening. Status update, I'm, I don't know, three or four hours into this. I've got all the motors and axes on there, put the hot end together, did this cable management wire routing thing. So far so good, I think. Don't want to jinx myself. This has taken me back to my erector set days. Although embarrassed, I think I'm man enough to admit that I'm taking full advantage of their spare parts kit. Mostly fasteners. One thing they don't tell you in the manual, you need a lot of good lighting. Like these parts are gigantic compared to what I've been working with. Well, not these, but they're black and they have that 3D print texture. The way they reflect light down here, I'm seeing them like that dragon head optical illusion, like where they're the inverse of the actual parts that they are. Like I swear a couple of times, I thought I was looking at the mirror image of the part compared to the picture that's in the manual. Maybe that's just me and all the lithium grease I've been eating. All right, only 50 hours later and there she is. Nothing left to do, but try her out. Okay, Joseph. T, Earl Grey, hot. Okay, not bad, that's pretty close, I guess. This cute little thing, from what I understand, is the benchmark model everybody judges their printers by. Its name is Benchy. 
It's even got a little captain's wheel in there. I don't know what I'm looking at, but I'm hoping maybe this says something to some of you 3D printing people out there. I mean, I'm happy with the result. It's got some very, very fine, like, whiskers. Those wispy threads of filament. But, to me, I mean, heck, this looks like one seaworthy vessel. Again, if anybody sees something I don't, much appreciated if you'd leave something down in the comments. This is their code. It's right off the little SD card. This is how you get files onto the printer. I did no CAD or slicing, didn't screw with any of the settings. Just loaded up the PLA and fired up Benchy. Speaking of material, I've been doing most of my printing with PLA filament. It's my understanding it's the easiest to work with, basically plays the nicest with 3D printing. But I also have some ABS and a spool of PETG, but I haven't even unpacked that yet. Different plastics, different material properties. Some are more pliable, some are more rigid, brittle, elastic, tough, all of the things you'd expect. In theory, you'd print with the material best suited to the kind of part you need to make. Just for kicks, I printed a second whistle. This is out of the ABS, ASA. I've got two kids, only had one whistle. That kind of math doesn't fly. And naturally, two whistles help to increase the level of chaos around the house. And yes, as it turns out, what people are saying appears to be true. ASA is a little bit more sensitive to heat, or drafts, or temperature, I guess, while printing. My printer doesn't have an enclosure yet, and I'm in a drafty garage, and hopefully you can see the first layer, this was down on the bed, pulled away a bit, stuck where it had more contact area, picked up on this thinner part. By the time it got to the top, it had straightened out. So, a little more finicky to print. With the 3D printer, I've now managed to start a little side project I've always wanted to work on. I present to you Burn Arnold 1.0, also an ABSA, not for any particular reason other than the color. I didn't want a gray skull. He doesn't do much just yet. But you just wait. I also ran some string trimmer line through this and some ER70S6. The Weed Whacker line printed some great solo cups, an absolute hit at the party. The 70S6, however, I must have had the slicer settings wrong or the wrong nozzle size, I'm not sure, but the 123 and V-block I printed came out at a weird scale. I've had this thing together about a week now and I'm having an absolute blast. I know I'm five years behind the times, but this thing has been great. 3D printing adds a whole new dimension to 2D printing. There are two things I really like about this printer you might not expect. First, it's a whole lot easier to use than I thought. Other than the whole it showing up in a million pieces thing, once together, I was up and running. Don't get me wrong, 3D printing can be complicated, just like any other CNC thing. You can certainly get into the weeds if you want to, but the software that this comes with, in easy mode anyway, you just tell it the filament you're using, the size of the nozzle on the printer, place your model on the virtual bed, and have it spit out G-code. Put the card in the side, hit print, lemon squeezy chicken dinner, or something to that effect. Second, once it is printing, and I might just jinx myself here, I've had zero problems. Not one problem. I really expected my first dozen prints or so would be bird's nests of highly engineered thermoplastic. Machine going wild, squirting white hot resin all over me. Mildly comedic stuff like that. That there'd be a learning curve. Figuring out settings, feeds and speeds, so forth, etc., etc. My experience couldn't have been further from that. Literally zero problems. And, and, it runs completely unattended. Like 1990s supermodel over here, took somewhere around 22-ish hours. If nothing else, I expected at least a completely unraveled spool with filament knotted everywhere. Though, there is bad news. This thing sent me back 750 clamps. Add to that shipping, two or three extra rolls of filament, a couple of nozzles. Well, it added up. Had I bought this already assembled, as of today, I would have had to cough up 250 more clams. Though, now that it's done, in retrospect, building it myself was probably the better option. Took the mystery out of what I'm looking at and how it does what it does. If that's a tough pill to swallow, there are options. As I mentioned, I have a lot of 3D printed friends. Their recommendation was either this one or the Creality Ender. I think, which comes in at a whopping 200 bucks. I can't speak for that thing because I didn't get it, but if they recommended it, it probably does a decent job for the money. You do get what you pay for, but the Creality will likely do the job. 
Truth be told, I'm not much of a 3D printing kind of a guy. Maybe that's unfair, likely just due to never having one here at home. But with everything else I had going on, I didn't want to sink a ton of time into a budget printer. Not saying that they need more attention. I don't know, but come on. I'm old enough to read the writing on the wall. Or make it out phonetically at any rate. These things printed out as one piece. Well, as one print. You have to admit that's pretty cool. This, by the way, is the new spindle bearing for my milling machine. That's it, I think. You'll probably see more of this in the future. Maybe not a ton, but occasionally you get finicky parts you don't want to take the time to machine. And if they're a good fit for 3D printing, well, now it's here. You know what I'm talking about, those stupid little parts, broken wheels for the shower or closet door, brackets for some junk kit furniture, broken car ashtray, parts you don't even recognize sometimes. The kind of thing people might bring you all the time because you can fix anything, but your only real solution is crazy glue. With the 3D printer, I can now sink even more time and effort into it and really build up good momentum for that what do you mean 50 bucks fight that always happens. Okay, I'm getting cheeky. Time to wrap this up. Short story, five years late. This is a match made in heaven for things like prototypes, conceptual stuff, mock-ups, maybe even the occasional very real part you need that you might not want or be able to mill, turn, weld, or otherwise fabricate yourself. Anyway, hope you enjoyed following along. As always, I very much appreciate the company and thanks for watching.